The Nintendo Entertainment System is still one of the most popular and beloved game consoles of all time. Games are still being made for the NES even today, and will continue to be made for many years to come. You too can become part of the NES homebrewer hacking community by learning how games for the NES are programmed. This guide will cover NES architecture, setting up your programming environment, understanding your assembly file, getting started with sprites, more on sprites, and where to go next. Unfortunately, this guide won't cover how to program in 6502 assembly, so I'm assuming that whoever watches this video will have a working knowledge of it. What this guide is supposed to be is a jumping off point so that you can feel comfortable enough to begin your journey into programming the NES, but there is a lot to learn first, beginning with NES architecture. The Nintendo Entertainment System has three different processors, the central processing unit, the picture processing unit, and the audio processing unit. But it would be useless to talk about the NES system alone because it also requires a game cartridge in order to do anything. Every game cartridge is a set of computer chips that includes the program ROM and the character ROM. To briefly overview each part of the NES, the CPU is a Ricoh 2A03 with an MOS Technology 6502 core. This means that the same 6502 assembly that is used on other 8-bit computers of that era, like the Apple II and the Commodore VIC-20, is also used for the NES. The CPU has direct access to 2K of RAM that can be used and manipulated on the fly. It is also the only processor that the programmer has direct communication with. The other two processors, the PPU and the APU, are only able to be given instructions via the CPU writing to certain addresses in memory, but we'll talk more about that later. The PPU covers functions related to creating the video signal that is the game image. It displays a 256 by 240 picture at 60 FPS. The PPU also has its own 2K of RAM that it uses for its operations. It is then able to access the character ROM of the game cartridge, which houses all the visual sprite data to show them on the screen. The CPU of the NES can read and write to nine different addresses in memory called the PPU registers in order to get the PPU to do things like draw sprites, change colors, and scroll the screen. The PPU can only be properly communicated with at a certain time in between where the PPU has finished drawing the screen and is waiting for the next opportunity to start again. This state is known as V-Blank and is very important later on in our programs. Talking to the PPU at any other time could result in graphical glitches in our program. The APU, as the name would suggest, is in charge of audio. The NES has five voice channels, which can produce two square waves, a triangle wave, noise, and the last can produce a PCM sampled sound. As mentioned before, it's up to the CPU to read and write through specific APU registers in order to produce an audio signal from the NES. The game cartridge, as mentioned before, is most importantly the home of the program ROM, the game logic written in direct CPU instructions, and the character ROM, the sprite data. The size of these two does depend on the physical chips that are used. However, in this tutorial, I'm going to be explaining how to create a virtual NES game cartridge called a .NES file, which means that all our chips will be defined in our program digitally later. Then the resulting NES file can be played by an emulator or copied onto a cartridge adapter and played on a real machine. Here's a list of what we need in order to write, compile, run, and debug our program. We first need something to write our program with. Our assembly code is just plain text, usually ending with a .s or .asm extension. So Notepad, Sublime Text, or anything else will do just fine. I'm going to be using Notepad++ because I can define my own language with custom colors. I'm going to be using an adapted version of the 6502 language config, and both my version and the original config file are linked down below. Now remember, the NES was around long before the JPG or PNG existed, and so sprite data is stored in character ROM in a unique way. Luckily, there are plenty of tools to help us. We're going to go download a program called YYCHR to allow us to visualize the data like it will appear on screen in the NES. More on how to use this program later. Then, once we eventually write out our assembly code in a file, we'll need to compile it into an NES program. One of the most popular compilers for many 6502 machines is CC65, which at its core is a C compiler. But because we're writing an assembly code already, we can skip the part where the code would be compiled into assembly language. What we can do is use the assembler to assemble our assembly file and turn it into machine code, a very low level CPU instructions, which is output in an object file. 
Then we can take the linker and turn our object file into our final .nes file, which we can then run using an emulator. FCEUX is the industry standard NES emulator. It can do essentially anything and everything you want an emulator to do, from playing in slow motion, to recording your game, to giving you a live look into the memory of the machine itself. All these resources can be found linked down below. With everything downloaded, I'm going to move CC65 into a new folder, in this case I'm putting it into an empty D drive, then I'm going to create a new folder called Program as well. Now that the proper environment is set, let's understand what we need in our assembly file, our virtual game cartridge. Let's create a new file and call it cart.s. This virtual game cartridge is broken into five segments. The header, the zero page, the startup or code section, vectors, and characters. The kind of header we'll be using is the NES 2.0 type. It's backwards compatible with the older iNES headers, but provides more functionality. What we're going to type under this header segment is byte NES and byte 1A. This is the identification string. Every NES program needs this. The next byte is going to define how much program ROM in 16 kilobyte units we want. For now, I'm just going to write that we have two 16K units, so 32K in total. And similar for the next byte, it defines how much character ROM we have in 8K units. And we'll just say that we have one 8K unit of character ROM. The next byte covers which mapper we use and what mirroring we want. Uh, we're not that complex at this point, so we'll leave it as zero for now. The next nine bytes are also unimportant for our purposes here today, so we'll leave them blank for now, but certainly check out the NES dev wiki linked down below on what these do, because eventually they do become useful. The next segment we have is our zero page. This is the first of eight pages of 256 bytes of memory in the NES. We use this first page to define variables we need to use throughout our program. And although we don't have anything we need yet, let's create an example variable by typing out variable, whatever you want to name it, reserve one. And this reserves one byte of memory in the zero page for this variable. Now we're going to skip startup for now and jump down to vectors. These are definitions of what to do if a particular kind of event called an interrupt happens. There are three of these kind of interrupts we can define here. The first is the non-maskable interrupt. This is what is going to be called when the PPU begins the v-blink. We'll write our code so that any changes to the sprites will occur during this time period in order to avoid graphical glitches. Our second interrupt is reset. This is what happens right after someone hits the reset button on the NES. So we're going to have to make sure that our code initializes everything in the proper way once it gets pressed. The third is for specialized hardware interrupts. We're not going to be doing anything so complex today, so we won't worry about that for now. So let's go back to our startup segment and write what will happen after each interrupt. We have our reset and our NMI here. These are just labels that the CPU will jump to at those defined interrupts. We're not going to do anything here just yet. We'll just create a loop so it doesn't go anywhere after the machine resets. And then after that, for our NMI, we end this by saying return to interrupt. Then our last segment is for the character realm. Now, what I'm going to write here is include binary rom.character. This tells our assembler to include a binary file called rom.character. Now it would be really boring to use a blank character rom file, so I'm going to use this 8k of rom I created earlier, and I'm going to copy that into our program folder. You can create a new file if you want using yychr or just use mine here. Just make sure that it is exactly 8K big. So now let's do a test compile to make sure we've done everything right so far. I'm actually going to create a batch script for this command because it really is quite a mouthful. 
What we're doing here is using CC65 to first assemble our file and then take the resulting output, the object file, and then use the linker to create our final output and NES file. So hopefully you understand the commands I've written out here. I am only stepping out of the folder so that it is a bit more readable. But of course, you could have very long paths written out here, just as long as they point to the right file. So let's go to command prompt and navigate to where our folder is that we have our project in. And then I'm going to run this command using compile.back. And if it didn't work, we would get some error messages here, but it seemed to work correctly. So uh, here is our output NES file right here. So we can open that up and see if it works correctly. Yes, this is what you should see on your screen right now. So now that we can get the file running, let's set it up like a proper program and see if we can get the sprite to display. Now let's go back to our reset section of our code. Now when the system starts up, it's going to start calling interrupts which would take away from our actual setting up of the program. So we're going to turn that off with the SEI command. Another important thing to do first off is to turn off decimal mode. The NES doesn't have decimal mode, so it's just good practice to turn it off with CLD. Then we'll want to disable the sound IRQ for now. We'll do that by typing load X percent 01000000, this is decimal 64, hex 40. Then store that in one of the APU registers. Then we also need to disable the PCM voice channel. So we'll load X0, then store that in the address 4010. Then we'll initialize the stack register. Again, you don't have to worry about all the technical things now. Just know that this is best practice. We will load XFF and then we will transfer X to the stack. Now we'll start to zero everything out. We don't want any leftover data on the system, so we'll clear out the PPU and the CPU's memory as well. We'll load X0, then store that in the PPU registers. This just tells the PPU to hide everything for now. And then we need to wait for the aforementioned VBlink. This is our signal that we're okay to do work. So we'll use this trick here, where we wait for the first bit of the PPU register tied to 2002 to be a one letting us know that we are in vblink, we are waiting for the next screen to be drawn. This is saying to go back to the last anonymous label, this one right here, until the first bit of 2002 is a one. Then we're in vblink, then we can continue. Once vblink begins, we're going to want to clear out all 2K of memory on the system. So we'll write out a function like this. Our X register is currently sitting at zero. So we can just transfer that to the accumulator here. Then we'll create a new label and we'll store our accumulator at memory address 0x. Then we can increase our x and compare it to 0. Because once it reaches ff and increases one more time, it'll wrap back around to 0, meaning we've done all 256 bytes. This is an example of direct addressing. If you don't know what's going on here, I suggest you read one of the links down below about assembly. Then if it's not equal to zero yet, if it's still in the loop, we'll branch back to clear memory. So this sets the first 256 bytes of memory to zero. But we need to do this seven more times for the remaining seven pages of memory in the NES. But instead of creating seven more loops and wasting a lot of space and time, we can just have it go through each section at the same time, all using the same X index. So we'll copy this seven times and change the memory address here. And this will clear the memory of the system from zero to seven FF. But we are going to be using this section from 200 to two FF for our sprites. So we actually need to set these to the value of FF and not zero. So what we'll do here is we'll take this and copy it down here, and then we'll load the accumulator to FF, store that in the 200 range, and then load the accumulator back to zero. And this will set our memory in that range to FF so that sprites won't appear when we don't want them to. Now this will actually take a lot of time 
for the CPU to do. So we'll have to wait for the V blank once again before we talk to the PPU. So we'll copy down this command once more where we wait for V blank. So now we'll tell the PPU which section of CPU memory our sprites are at. And we already have 202FF ready to go. So we'll load the accumulator to two. This is the most significant byte of memory location here. And we'll store that at 4014. Then we'll have to wait for the transfer to actually happen. So we'll call a no op command. What we're telling the PPU here to do is to take all the memory from 200 to 2FF and place that in its memory to draw the sprites. And we'll add some of our own data to the 200 range very soon here. But right now it's time to set up our palette data. These are the colors we want the NES to use for each sprite. And it starts in the PPU's memory at 3F00. So we'll have to tell the PPU where we want it to write in its memory. Again, the CPU can't directly write to the PPU's memory. So what we have to do is load 3F, the most significant byte, and store that in 2006. Then we take the least significant byte, 0, and store that in 2006 again. So now the PPU is ready to read or write at that memory location. But before we write to the PPU here, we need to know what to write. There are a total of 32 colors, four palettes of four colors each for the background and then the foreground sprites. So we'll create some data at the end of our startup code called palette data. And I'm just going to copy and paste this in here and I'll show you what this means in a minute. Then we'll hop back up to where we just were and load them in. We read or write to the memory address we just pointed the PPU to by reading or writing to memory address 2007. So we'll write a loop here, I'll call it load palettes, and then load all 32 bytes of palette data into the PPU. Whenever we read or write to memory address 2007, the PPU steps forward one byte in memory. So we go from 3F00 to 3F01 and so on. So we don't have to keep changing the address the PPU is pointed to. It's going forward automatically. Now we're going to be drawing four sprites on the screen as well. So we'll have to add another data section here at the bottom. We'll call it sprite data. Each sprite is defined by four bytes, which represent the Y coordinate, the sprite number, as in which of the 256 sprites it is in character ROM, sprite attributes, and the X coordinate. If we go and open our character ROM right now in YYCHR, we can see that from the sprite numbers I've written down, I've chosen sprites 0, 1, 10, and 11, and this is hexadecimal again, and each sprite is 8 pixels large, so I have offset them by 8 pixels apart from the original X and Y of 4040. And then we can see they have no special attributes right now. So this byte is blank. Then we'll jump back to where we were and store those at the beginning of 200 with another loop. Again, 4 bytes per sprite, 4 sprites total for a total byte count of 16 or 10 in hexadecimal. Now our setup is finished so we can have interrupts be called again. We'll call CLI to do that. Then we can tell the PPU to generate an NMI whenever VBlank occurs, letting us know that we can safely reload our sprites or talk to the PPU. This is what the first one in this byte does. The second one in this byte tells the PPU to use the second section of 256 sprites on the background, which we're going to be using later. Then we'll store that into 2000. Then we tell the PPU to stop hiding the sprites and the background. Remember, we turned it off at the beginning of the reset. So we're just turning it back on with this byte value, then storing that in 2001. And the last thing we need to do is continue to copy our sprite data into the PPU continually. Otherwise, it will decay over time. So we'll just go down to our non-maskable interrupt handler load to and then store that in the right place in the PPU's memory, just like before. And there we go. Let's do a test compile to make sure that everything is all right. And I have one warning here. And it's because of this command that I wrote earlier. So we'll just get rid of that. 
and then we'll compile again. And this is what your program should look like right now. So now let's take a more in-depth look at one of the most important parts of your program, the graphics. We have the program open here in FCEUX, and then we can click on Debug PPU Viewer, and this brings up a great view of what is in the PPU's memory right now. And we also get to see what our color palettes look like too. Remember those 32 bytes of palette data we wrote out? These are the corresponding colors. The NES is capable of producing 64 colors, with the caveat being that a fair chunk of those are black or similar shades of gray, but we can choose any combination of colors for our color palettes. So to show you the process of creating a new sprite, I'm just going to draw out something really simple here in YYCHR. I'm going to be drawing a sword. The first thing I'm going to do is set the current palette I'm using to be the same as palette number one. That is the palette after palette zero. Then I'll use the brush tool here to draw it out as I want. And then let's jump to where I have it finished. Okay, and here I have half a sword. Now I could use YYCHR to copy and flip it around here, but I'm not going to. And I'm going to show you why soon. So let's jump back into our code and let's begin to input our sprite data for the sword. I'm just going to arbitrarily draw this at coordinates 80, 50. So that's 50 for the Y. The top left sprite is going to be sprite number eight. I'll leave the attributes as zero for now and then 80 for the X coordinate. Okay, and the next sprite is going to be exactly the same but move it over eight pixels in the X direction, X 88. Then for the bottom, it's going to be exactly the same as well, except the Y will be shifted to 58 and the sprite number will be 18 hexadecimal. Now, as for the attributes, this one byte defines a lot of things, depending on which bits are ones and which are zeros. It defines which of the four palettes to use, whether to appear in front of the background or behind it, and whether to flip the sprite horizontally or vertically. I'll input the sprite attributes in binary so that you can see what I'm doing. I want to set them all to palette one first. So seven zeros and a one. Then I want to horizontally flip the second and fourth sprite to mirror the right hand of the sword. So I flip the second bit to one as well. Then before we compile again, we need to go up to where we copied in our sprite data under our load sprites label and increase that to 20 hex or 32 bytes because we now have eight total sprites, four bytes each, 32 bytes. Then we can compile again, look at our program, and there is our sword. Now implementing a background is a little less straightforward. Unlike the foreground where we could define where on screen the sprites are via X, Y coordinates, the background is always there and is a static 960 characters in memory. With 32 characters per line, that gives us 30 lines, although not all lines are always visible, but check NES Dev Wiki for more information there. But what this means is that right now, we actually do have a background going on in our program. It's just all set to be character zero. And what is character zero? We can open up our character ROM and see it's the background color, it's nothing. And we could easily change this by changing this character to anything else recompile and see, yes, it did actually change, but we'll leave it blank for our purposes here right now. Drawing out the sprites for the background character in YYCHR is the same as before. Here I should mention there are tools that help you take modern image formats and convert it into NES sprite data, and I did use them to roughly create my background here, but I won't go over these tools right now but this is the character ROM in the project folder on GitHub, so you can follow along with that. But where do we put this background information? The background data is stored in the PPU's memory in what is called a name table, 
the first of several name tables is located in the PPU's memory starting at 2000 and goes to 23BF. So because there are 32 characters per line at one byte each, if we wanted to begin our background eight lines down, we would begin to store it at 2100. So first off, I'll import my background data that I have written out beforehand. This is the order in which I want my background characters to appear. I'll call it background data. So then we can jump up to right after where we loaded our sprites and we can create a new label called load background. And hopefully you can follow my code here. I'm setting the registers of the PPU so that it is looking at memory address 2100, and then loading my background data byte by byte and storing it in the correct location in the PPU. This isn't great assembly, but it gets the job done. Also, we're going to reset the scroll right now, otherwise it won't show up in the right place. And then we can just recompile again, and there it is. But this isn't the correct color palette for it. I want it in palette one, when it's colored in palette zero right now. See, there's a little space between 23CO and 2400, where the second name table starts, that defines the color of the background for name table one. It is sectioned off into two by two squares of sprites defined by a quarter of a byte, with those squares themselves defined in a four by four square taking up one byte of memory, with the byte defined in order like this. So what this means is that to make my background use the correct color palette, then I have to do some math to find out where the character color definitions I want to change are located at. Being eight lines down puts me at memory address 23D0. Then I can take this background palette data, copy it in, and because my background covers a total of 16 lines, that's a total of 32 bytes of data to define the right background colors. And setting each group of tiles to the first palette means I set them all to hexadecimal 55. Then I can create another loop to place that data at the right location in the PPU, just like this here. And now recompiling everything once more and opening our NES file, we see that it does indeed switch us to the right background palette. These tiles around the map here are the universal background color, and so it doesn't change with each palette. Please keep that in mind. And this is what you need to know to get started programming the NES. Programming the NES can be frustrating at times, but there's a great community of support out there. I didn't have time to cover controller input, making use of the APU, or how to do a host of other things on the NES. But the NES Dev Wiki will be your Bible as you continue to learn how to do these things. And check out some of the other great video guides I have linked down below from other people as well. A lot of their work really helped me out when I was first getting started myself. And if you want to see more like this, then please subscribe. Check out some of my other work as well at notin.tokyo. And as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>